Ironic as it may seem, Pro Football's World Series takes place the first week of the 1950 season as the Cleveland Browns, champions of the All-American Conference, take on the defending kingpins of the NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles. 85,000 fans gets a thrill in the opening period as Cleveland's Don Phelps has long gone on a 70-yard scamper to the end zone. The opening minute set the tone for a game in which the Browns, in a word, overwhelmed the complacent and unprepared Eagles. The vaunted Eagle defense proved no match for the Browns' aggressive passing game. Cleveland attacked with such lightning efficiency that its effect on the Eagles was akin to shell shock. The Browns rendered the Eagles into a trance-like state as ball carriers bounced off of day's tacklers for big gains. In perhaps the greatest team debut in sports history, the Browns' route of the world champions stunningly demonstrated they were not only worthy of the NFL, but they would be a giant of the league for years to come. Not bad for a Bush League team with a high school coach. This was a great football team, and Paul Brown will go down in history as one of the great all-time NFL coaches. And the Cleveland Browns were for real, and we found this out. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey now, what's new? How's it going, everybody? My name is Tim Hanlon, and once again, you have found Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. And uh, we uh, we segue back into football, pro football. It's in the air. Uh, the Super Bowl is uh, upon us, and uh, we uh, we want to dial it back. We're going to go way back into the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, and in a crucial and very interesting time uh, in the history of professional football. And this is around the time when the uh, All America Football Conference is uh, giving the NFL a good kick in the butt. Uh, in the post-war years of the 19, late 1940s, uh, and uh, and a team in particular that uh, dominated, and that's uh, perhaps uh, not even the strongest uh, word to describe, the Cleveland Browns of the uh, American, excuse me, the All-America Football Conference uh, from 1946 until uh, 1949. And uh, the clip that you just heard uh, was their first ever season in the NFL, the National Football League, uh, the team that uh, uh, was uh, arguably looked upon as being somewhat uh, questionable uh, in the minds of the uh, brain trust of the uh, the bigger and uh, more uh, established NFL in 1950 as it absorbed uh, the remnants of the AAFC and in particular the Cleveland Browns, who, uh, as uh, you may remember from some of our previous conversations, uh, not only dominated the AAFC, but kind of really worthy, worthy AAFC. Uh, they won every single of the four championships uh, of that uh, four-year existence of that league. And um, despite uh, multiple uh, opportunities, or not even opportunities, but suggestions to challenge uh, the NFL in, in various games during the, uh, the existence of that league, never had the chance until... Uh, Burt Bell, the then commissioner of the NFL in 1950, decided, hey, you know what? Let's sort of put this uh, uh, this competition thing, this rivalry thing, this uh, challenge of anything from the old then a- old AF- AAFC uh, to rest. And let's just start our 1950 season, shall we, by putting the supposed best of the AAFC, the Cleveland Browns, against the world champion Philadelphia Eagles, shall we? Let's 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 begin the season. Uh, with uh, with this uh, sort of uh, a battle, and uh, just let's see how good or how decent this uh, this challenger team from this uh, no longer with us league uh, is in the face of the dominance of uh, of the Eagles in the NFL. And oh boy, were both the Eagles and the National Football League surprised and uh, put on notice uh, by the Cleveland Browns. And that's the conversation uh, that we're going to be centering on today with our guest Andy Piasek. Uh, he, the author uh, of, of a very interesting book called The Best Show in Football, the 1946 to 1955 Cleveland Browns. And and in that and in this conversation, uh, you will hear uh, a uh, 
a very difficult to argue with uh, logic and reasoning about uh, this team, the Cleveland Browns, in its two sort of incarnations during this period of time. They being sort of one of the charter and uh, and dominant franchises of the All-America Football Conference. And then circa 1950, coming into the National Football League and kicking butt and taking names immediately upon its arrival, including the first championship game of the NFL in 1950 that they had a chance to to win, uh, which they did going away. And we get into all of that. Uh, but the, uh, the 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 uh, the discussion around uh, the Cleveland Browns and their dynasty uh, across these two leagues uh, is uh, is the topic of conversation. And I think you're going to get some very interesting points of view uh, from Andy and, and, and rightly so about the place uh, in football's history where the Cleveland Browns, the original Cleveland Browns, shall we say, take in uh, in the pantheon of, of teams, uh, people like Paul Brown, uh, some of the great players like Lou Groza and, uh, and Otto Graham and some of the others. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting conversation and topic uh, about uh, not only the Cleveland Browns and their rightful place in NFL uh, uh, history, but also the, the broader history of pro football. Uh, the place of the All-America Football Conference in that history. And uh, with all due respect, uh, those years where the Cleveland Browns dominated that that challenger league and, and where it should fit, uh, if at all, in the in the the ongoing uh, tableau and history of the, of the National Football League. And um, it's still not without controversy, uh, but we're going to get into all of that with our guest Andy Piasek uh, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation. Andy is a... Uh, uh, a wealth uh, of information about this team, and you're going to hear and enjoy and learn from, I think, a lot of uh, his observations. And uh, we look forward to presenting that to you uh, in uh, just a couple of seconds' time. Uh, let us pick one of uh, our uh, our myriad of, of sponsors this week, and we want to call out uh, one of the newer ones, uh, and we urge you to uh, to take advantage of their wares and the little promotional goodness that we have for you. And it's Streaker Sports, streakersports.com. Uh, it is uh, they are the purveyor of sports culture and uh, they are uh, an amazing place uh, to find uh, great uh, T-shirts and logo uh, wear and all kinds of uh, a fascinating uh, a garb uh, for you to wear, and especially uh, to help remember some of these teams and leagues that we feature here on this little show every week. Uh, and uh, one great way to uh, to sort of show your support for the show, as well as some of these teams that uh, the time has, for whatever reason, forgotten. Uh, is to go to streakersports.com and uh, take a take a look at all the great stuff that they've got uh, and it, pick the sport, baseball and basketball and football and hockey. I mean, you name it. Some amazing stories uh, uh, behind some great uh, uh, T-shirts and, and uh, uh, uniforms and all kinds of other garb. And make sure when you find something, it's not a question of, uh, of if you're going to find something fun and cool, but when. And when you do at streakersports.com, make sure that you use the promo code GOODSEATS and uh, make sure that you get 10% off all of your purchases by doing so. Again, that's streakersports.com. And make sure you use that promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. Streaker Sports, the purveyor of sports culture. We thank them for uh, joining our growing roster of sponsors. And we thank you for giving them a try and uh, giving us a few shekels, uh, a few little peanuts, if you will, for uh, for trying them out and uh, hopefully making a purchase or two uh, there at Streaker Sports. Dot com. All right, let's uh, segue into uh, what I found to be a, a, an amazingly uh, rich conversation uh, about the Cleveland Browns, both of the All-America Football Conference of the late 1940s and their dynastic uh, continuation, shall we say, into the early uh, their early years of the NFL in the early 1950s uh, with our guest, our uh, a conversation with Andy Piasek coming up right now. We've had a number of interesting conversations uh, over the last year and a half around things like the AAFC. Um, we've touched on certainly the Cleveland Rams, but I don't think we've really kind of uh, gotten into um, uh, certainly the AAFC uh, version of the Browns in particular, right? Um, and that certainly fits within our genre very well. And and um, you know your uh, your your book is a really good um, and probably seminal. Uh, 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 almost defense, frankly, of uh, of the Browns franchise uh, during those AAFC years and those early uh, NFL years uh, as arguably one of the, if not the best uh, professional team 
um, you know, perhaps of all time. And um, it's a very interesting topic and conversation that I'd love to have. But first, before we even get in any of that, give us uh, give our audience a sense of um, of how you stumbled into this story uh, enough where you wanted to go deep and uh, and long into uh, into that uh, into that defense. I've been a writer of different kinds for a long time, and I grew up with an interest in sports. Football definitely was one of my favorites as a boy. And it so happened that my father, who was a youngish man uh, in the 1940s, was a big Cleveland Browns fan and had media guides and books that I had access to as a young boy that I read and reread over and over again, along with any number of other sports books. So... It's so, you know, and I was looking for a good topic for a sports book. Somebody had approached me about doing one, somebody who had read some articles that I had written. And that's what I decided to do. And it was simply a matter of um, getting together a lot of resource material. Any number of books have been written about the Browns at that point. There was also um, articles in publications that uh, of an organization that I belong to called the Pro Football Researchers Association. And it was also uh, a nice kind of task, and not all that difficult, actually, to track down some of the old-time players to do interviews with. So my original plan was just sort of to document the 10-year period, a really remarkable period, of the Browns from 1946 through the 1955 season, and then as I got into it more and sort of weighed, um, I guess, their achievements against teams of later vintage, especially the Packers of the 1960s, who are sort of held up as the holy grail of dynasties, um, it really looked to me like there was a good case to be made that the Browns were the best. And so that's basically what I ended up doing. Well, so, okay, so why, um, and this will probably frame a little bit of it, but so why those 10 years in particular? Um, I think I know the answer, but maybe helping to, to frame it for our audience, the because um, those 10 years really are arguably uh, kind of comprised of two sort of mini eras, if you will, of the Browns franchise, no? Up to a point. Um, there is a fair amount of continuity. Uh, there were two different leagues, obviously, and there were two different leagues that for the four-year period that the two leagues existed we're not playing each other. Uh, that 10 year period I picked because just, I mean, the Browns finished first place in their conference every year and played in their league championship game every year. That's 10 straight years, six straight years in the NFL after they joined the NFL in 1950. And, um, whether you want to break it down to six title games or 10, depending on how people evaluate the All-America Football Conference, no other team has done that. No other team has even come close to the six. We had the Buffalo Bills appear in four consecutive Super Bowls back in the early 90s. That's actually the next best uh, number in terms of consecutive appearances. And now keep in mind, you know, listeners who are perhaps younger and because the NFL intentionally and consciously and uh, over and over again tries to make it sound like football began with the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl, I'm equating the NFL championship game that existed in the 30-something years before the Super Bowl with the Super Bowl. It was not a conference championship game. If you go back and, or if you look in your newspaper tomorrow after the results of the game today, you'll see something like NFC championship game results or AFC championship game results. In the column of the NFC championship games, you'll see the games involving the Browns from the 50s that we'll be talking about today. To me, I think that's a complete distortion of history, uh, approaching a lie. The game that was played in the years prior to 1966 was equivalent to the Super Bowl. Now, we can get into little quibbles about, well, you know, there were, for a period of time, two different leagues that existed in the early 60s, and that's true. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. But certainly for the period of the 1950s, when there was one football league, and whoever won it was considered to be, since the United States is really the home and the only place besides Canada, where this kind of football was played at that time, 
the best football team in the world. It was not equivalent to whatever the winners of today's games are going to do, which is basically a semifinal game. So, yeah, so, I mean, just that 10-year period of excellence in terms of playing for the title of their league, of finishing in first place in their conference every year, in addition to other things that we can get into, like their winning percentage during those 10 years and all kinds of other stuff, um, it really just does jump out at you um, if you allow the biases that have been developed over the course of decades to kind of be try to put those off to the side. Um, I'm sure we're going to get into a little bit of a discussion about the Patriots and their tremendous run over the last 17 or 18 years. Um, and I hear it said almost as if it's an established fact with no possible discussion that the Patriots now are the greatest dynasty of all time, much as Belichick and Tom Brady are held up as the greatest of all time in their specific categories. Uh, I would say, you know, that they both of those, all three of those entities are in the discussion for the greatest in their different categories. But I think the idea that it's a closed case is ludicrous. Um, and what's out, you know, what jumps out at me is that these are statements that are often made by people who have no idea who Paul Brown was, who have no idea who Otto Graham was, who aren't even the most even vaguely familiar with what the Browns did in this 10 year run that we're talking about. So I know that's the nature of sports talk. You know, it doesn't matter what you know or what the facts are. If you say it loud enough and you're visible enough, then it becomes almost a truism. Um, I think, you know, for the serious football fan, for the serious sports fan, they really want to kind of get into, you know, what are the facts? And that's sort of what I attempted to try to do with the book. Well, and, and this is a little bit of, of why we kind of, I think, I think we evolved into this show uh, is to sort of um, go back a bit into uh, teams and leagues and situations that, uh, for whatever reason, history is either sort of forgotten, maybe maybe uh, uh, on purpose and for good reason, uh, but frankly, or maybe it's just steamrolled or, or or smoothed over, shall we say, right? So we've had many, many, many conversations and sort of, uh, questions, frankly, around sort of uh, modern versions of sports and leagues that exist today. And, and the I guess the the general bucket I could put it in is sort of selective memory, right? When it's convenient and or uh, potentially um, uh, profit inducing or protective, uh, the sort of uh, uh, reminiscences and or uh, fuzzy embrace of, of the past. But uh, in in times and situations where uh, current uh, uh, lever pullers, shall we say, or owners of such uh, may not want to remember certain things or uh, potential uh, uh, side uh, tracking or, or, uh, or frankly, just abject failures, uh, challenger leagues and, and then some. Um, and it's, it's a very valid point. And, and you know, with the Browns, right, I, I don't think anybody, you know, uh, even of a certain age sort of doesn't uh, revere and or understand sort of the contributions of folks like Paul Brown and, and that team. But but it's it's a very compelling point, right? Because there there is sort of that um, I don't know that uh, that uh, weight tip towards today and 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 current social media and sort of the I guess the 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 uh, the feeling that uh, because we're you know talking about it now in modern times that uh, what what came before uh, matters less and or it does not have a, as much weight uh, as uh, what uh, what happened in the past. I think that's absolutely true. I think it's. Um it's interesting to compare pro football with baseball, for example. Baseball historically has done a much different approach, a much better job, I would put it, of embracing its past, of propagating its past, of trying to popularizing its past. I think some of that has dwindled as we've kind of got into this hyper social media age, as you mentioned. Um, but you know, I mean, it's understood that when you talk about the greatest baseballs of all baseball players of all time, that people like Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio are in the discussion, even though none of those people has played for almost about 60 years. You would probably be hard pressed to find any player aside from Jim Brown from, you know, 
I don't know, the 1960s and earlier, who would ever, who would even be included in most such discussions. I mean, I make the mistake once in a while of tuning into the NFL network when they're doing these 10 best whatever shows, 10 best games, 10 best players, 10 best quarterbacks, whatever it might be. It's a bad habit I'm trying to break because they're just so idiotic often that well, it's, I mean, it's, it really, it's, it's television. It's television clickbait, right? I mean, you, you can always make more of those, and 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 the instant debate that comes with those as you make those selections, right? Yeah, but I think, yeah, I mean, sure, that's part of it, but it's also just the fact that it's a network that's run by the NFL is really a disgrace because it's it's not just you know people getting on there babbling who maybe we can agree aren't all that qualified to talk about a hundred years worth of history. It's the fact that people who were recognized clearly at their time as the best of their era or even for a period of time afterwards as the best ever or in the conversation of the best ever have dramatically dropped completely out of the picture and without really any kind of explanation or exploration of, well, why would that be true? Why would a guy and I'm talking about Otto Graham now, who won more championships, more and more, more and most valuable player awards, was all pro, first team all pro more times than any other quarterback in the history of football. What, how could it be possible that somebody like that could not make the list of the 10 best quarterbacks of all time on one of these stupid shows? Um, what, what's the information that you're using to... So is having is winning less championships and being MVP less times and all pro less times and winning fewer passing titles? Is that better? And don't believe me, I'm not thinking in any way, shape or form that the book that I wrote or any conversations that I have are going to have any dent on any of this, because I know that's not the case. Um but I would hope at minimum that there are thoughtful fans who are open and who base what they do or conclude or think on evidence and facts would take away a little bit of it for themselves, that it's a little bit of a different picture than what the popular media sort of presents. Well, it's also too, frankly, it's, and we're, we'll, let's get into the Browns specifically here. Uh, I mean, this is also sort of a continuation kind of story, right? So regardless of where... You know, as a as an historian, one would sort of put today's Cleveland Browns and, you know, are, are really the, uh, the the heritage of the old Browns really with the the uh, Baltimore Ravens and, and all the sort of machinations of, of, of team movements and where those histories uh, officially lie and, 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 and reside. Um, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, I, I think um, – you know, those who what, what's the sort of proverbial phrase, right? Those who sort of ignore history are, are doomed to repeat it. And and it's it's sort of not necessarily an admonition, but really, you know, d- does do you ever wonder as a modern day fan, as you're making your sports bets or your fantasy league uh, uh, roster selections, right? Uh, you know, wh- where these things called the Browns came from, like how the name come about, like uh, the team just like automatically just, you know, it been there ever since uh, since time began. No, of course not. Right. But it, that to me is kind of like you know part of part of all that. But let me let me throw out a very layman's right, and you're obviously the the, the more the expert on this topic, hence the conversation. But let let me sort of get throw out a layman's sort of uh, uh, theory here, maybe as uh, it, it, around say the Browns, right? Is it is the um, I don't know the questioning perhaps or why it's even a debate about how good uh, relative to other teams over the course of professional football history, the Browns were. Do you think that they, uh, through, um, you know, through the lens of, of historical uh, memory and and uh, and debate, uh, uh, falter a bit because they had the, um, uh, you know, I guess the uh, the issue of having been part of a, a challenger league to the NFL, the AAFC, uh, and the debate over whether the AAFC uh, is or was "Quote unquote top tier professional football and or should be remembered and or incorporated in the NFL records." I would say the answer is yes to all those things. Yes, uh, to a large extent, despite the greatness of the Browns in the six year period of the NFL portion of this dynasty, what you laid out is a big question mark that lingers over the whole thing. 
um, and I would say is maybe the main reason why some people would dismiss them uh, as the greatest dynasty. And, you know, I, that's understandable. I think in some ways there is some information out there, including some books about the All-America Football Conference that people can dive into if they're interested enough. Um, and even just reading portions of my book where I try to evaluate it, it's not simply just, you know, documenting, well, this is what happened, this is how it started, and this is why it ended or how it ended or all that. I really wanted to try to figure out, is there any kind of way that you can evaluate the relative strengths of the two leagues, considering that they never once played a single game against each other? And then the other factor that um, I think really weighs heavily in the Browns' favor is what they did after they came into the NFL. I mean, it's literally unprecedented. No other team in the history of the four major professional sports has ever come into an already existing league and won the championship of that league in their very first season. Never. Nobody. Ever. So, the, and then, it, you know, it, obviously it wasn't a fluke because for five more years, the team finished in first place, often in dominating fashion, in the Eastern Conference of the National Football League, this, you know, supposedly vastly superior league to the All-America Conference. There were people, and not just um, partisans, I mean, clearly there was a reason why owners of the Washington Redskins and other teams in the NFL were compelled to denigrate the Browns at the time of the merger and talk about how now they were going to really be playing against serious competition and that they would be lucky if they were a 500 team and odds were that they would be something worse. Um, but, you know, I mean, clearly they, what they did was exactly the opposite of what um, a lot of the anti Brown sentiment was at the time um, came in, won the championship and then played at basically the highest level for an additional five seasons after that without any kind of significant roster turnover, arguably possibly being a little bit weaker than they had been a year or two before that in the late years of the All-America Football Conference because of players who retired and that, um, weren't replaced by players who were as good. And I lay some of that out in the book as to specific personnel discussions. Um but yeah, so I think definitely going, you know, circling back to what you originally said, yes, I think not only are most modern fans likely to be completely unfamiliar with the All-America Football Conference, those that are, are going to basically be looking through it, looking at it through a prism that I think is somewhat distorted. Um, but I think the natural reaction of people, uh, who, whether they've heard about it or not, or know much of anything about it, is just to be dismissive of the possibility that the two leagues could have been at this uh, on a sim similar level, which is basically the conclusion that I come to. Well, let, let's talk about the AAFC, right? Because you know it is. Um, we've had a few a few conversations uh, about it, and, and certainly a lot, lot more depth and investigation, I think, to go. Um, but, you know, it, I, I'm really curious as to sort of uh, the, you know, the, the foundings of the Browns as a member of that um, competitive league. Right. So coming out of, uh, uh, you know, the end of uh, of uh, the, the Great World War Two, um, the uh, you know, you have pro football, which um, has sort of still at that point uh, never really been sort of uh, top tier, say, relative to the college game or even baseball. Um, and all of a sudden, right, you've got some very uh, deep pocketed investors, right, arguably even more well off collectively than, say, uh, those of the uh, the legacy NFL owners, right, who, you know, uh, held fort and, and, and kept things going even in the darkest days and depletion of, of, of squads and whatnot from the war. Um, maybe you can give our audience a sense, uh, sort of in general terms, sort of how, how the, the Browns franchise sort of came to be. Uh, in the midst of this new league, especially given that the 
Cleveland Rams were um, such a, a relatively stable uh, force themselves in the NFL uh, at that time. Yes, it's, it certainly was sort of an odd time for somebody to come up with the idea of starting a new football league because it actually goes back to 1944 when the war was still being very much uh, waged. It was the brainchild of a sports writer from the Chicago Tribune by the name of Arch Ward. He was probably maybe the most famous sports writer in the country. He had had two successful ventures up to that point, highly successful actually, in that he was the initiator of the baseball all-star game, which originally was planned as a one-shot affair in 1933 in Chicago, where he was based at Comiskey Park and proved to be so successful that it continues to be played every year up until today. He also initiated the college all-star game, which was a football game also played in Chicago at Soldier Field every summer between the defending NFL champion and a collection of the best recently graduated college players. So he had a definite track record and he had a platform. And when he said things and made known that he was going to be doing something, people paid attention. And so it was actually odd in the sense that he was doing this at in the middle of the war at a time when NFL teams were suspending play for a season or time. And a couple of cases, I guess, uh, combining themselves into one entity, two teams playing as one entity for a short period of time, just simply because of costs. And also, as you mentioned, because any number of players were not available because they were in the service. The wise decision that they ended up making once Archboard began to get the investors on board that you mentioned was that they would wait until the summer of 1946 before they would begin operations playing. They began signing players and putting together staff and building all the stuff that needs to be done to create a football team right from the beginning. But clearly it would have been a much more uh, treacherous road had they decided to play, say, in 1945 than in 1946. And the other thing I'll say before I get to the specifics of the Browns is that on the plus side, it was kind of a unique situation because you had this pool of players who were, as they began coming back from the service, were available to be signed who otherwise would have been either signed already by NFL teams or who would have been going back to college. So, for example, you had players all through that time, the 43, 44, 45, who were being drafted. Whether they had actually completed their college eligibility or not, and were then technically the property of the NFL team that drafted them. But there was basically no time when they were being drafted into the military shortly after, what you know, while they were still playing or after, immediately after graduating college. So there was no time to be haggling over, you know, signing a contract. They were being sent over to do something much more serious. So as we get to 45 and 46, uh, when the All-America Conference teams are beginning to sign players, lots of these players, in addition to those who continue to come out of college, are now a sort of unofficial free agent pool that can be signed um, because they have not signed contracts. And even in some cases where they had already signed contracts, the New contracts were offered and players just simply disregarded the previous contracts that they had signed. And then also, I mean, and like I said, some of these players never even went back to college to finish what eligibility they had left. Uh, Lou Groza is a perfect example. Lou Groza was a freshman at Ohio State when Paul Brown was the coach of Ohio State. He had been recruited, re re been recruited. He was from Southern Ohio. He's a well-known athlete as a high schooler in Ohio went into the service after his freshman season for three years, I guess it was, never returned to Ohio State to play football. But uh, Paul Brown had seen enough of him as a high schooler and as a freshman to sign him to a pro contract in 1946, at which point Groza was 22 years old and his high college class had technically graduated. And so... Um, 
this kind of thing, while not common, did make up a fairly substantial pool of players for both leagues. Dante Lavelli is another one, played one year of varsity football at Ohio State for Paul Brown and did the same thing that Groza did. And there are others. I mentioned those two because those are both players who went on to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and are, you know, the most visible, but there were others. So anyway, um, one of the people who was in contact with Arch Ford was a guy named Arthur McBride, who was based in Cleveland, was a businessman, big football fan, and he decided to invest uh, whatever the amount was, which I don't have at my fingertips. It would not be anything comparable, even adjusted to what a franchise would go for years later. But it was a significant investment, and it was definitely a risky proposition, which people knew at the time. Um, And it basically took off from there. Uh, McBride eventually was, it was recommended to him that Paul Brown was a rising youngish coach who he should consider hiring, which he did. And, you know, Paul Brown had had tremendous success both at high school and in a short period of time at Ohio State. So basically, Paul Brown, you know, very meticulous guy, very organized, very knowledgeable, both about what he wanted to do in terms of how to play football, but also in terms of how he wanted to build a team. And he, you know, more so, I think, than now, where you have the rise of football in places like Florida and Texas and Southern California, that whole area around the Great Lakes was the ground zero for football. So not only in terms of talent, but in terms of interest. So Paul Brown was exposed to all the great college players of the Big Ten, uh, of the smaller schools within Ohio, like Miami of Ohio, uh, Toledo, all these places where he ended up signing players who ended up having very good pro careers. He was in on it and had an up-close look at all those players much more so than probably anybody else, even in the NFL. So the big question, I mean, there's a lot, I don't, I can go on and on about this. I mean, the big question confronting the Cleveland franchise is exactly the one that you mentioned, which is that McBride went in investing, knowing that there was an established team in the NFL that had actually won that actually went on to win the NFL championship in 1945. So the expectation was that it was going to be a head-to-head uh, competition in Cleveland and it's a good chance that there would be a lot of money lost before anybody was going to be able to be making any profits. All right, time for me to catch my breath, get a cool, tasty beverage, and uh, remind you, while we do so, that uh, our friends at Audible uh, are here to uh, remind you that uh, you can get a free audiobook download uh, of your choice from over 180,000 titles uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats and uh, use that link, of course, to uh, try for yourself a free audiobook on us, uh, gratis, if you will. And you will love the idea of audiobooks. It's uh, it's an awesome way to kill time uh, and uh, occupy and stimulate your mind, uh, perhaps when your eyes are busy uh, doing uh, something else. And of course, there are plenty of uh, interesting books to be found, especially in the world of sports and sports history. And I think our audience might enjoy a few of these, of course, including uh, the seminal work by uh, baseball uh, legend Jim Bouton. It's called Ball Four. It is uh, not only written, but it's also narrated by him. You could use your free credit for that book. And of course, as you know, Ball Four uh, centers around the 1969 uh, one-year wonder that is the uh, Seattle was the Seattle Pilots of Major League Baseball. But obviously, the uh, the background for a whole lot of other observations about the sport of baseball, and it remains to this day uh, perhaps uh, one of the most celebrated writings about the sport of baseball. Uh, in this country. Of course, you can also, if you're not a big baseball fan, you can go into the world of soccer uh, with uh, the autobiography called My Turn by Johan Cruyff, the uh, uh, late Johan Cruyff, uh, perhaps one of the world's best ever uh, soccer players. Uh, He of Dutch heritage, of course, Uh, plenty of uh, great legendary years at club play as well as national team play 
uh, for the Dutch team, as well as for our audience, maybe a little bit of interest, uh, his journeys in the North American Soccer League in the late 70s and early 80s with the uh, Washington Diplomats uh, and the uh, Los Angeles Aztecs. And of course, if you're into football, uh, there's probably no better book, especially if you find yourself uh, really interested in the sort of deep and rich history of the NFL with uh, the book called NFL Football, a History of America's New National Pastime. It is written by Richard Crapeau and narrated by Marlon May. That, too, uh, is uh, an audiobook that you could choose from over, like I said, uh, 180,000 titles. Uh, there's got to be something in there that's going to be of interest to you. And by all means, give it a try. And we appreciate your doing so at audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And again, you're going to get your free uh, audiobook download. You can cancel it any time. And again, even if you cancel it, you can keep that book as long as your device exists. So again, we appreciate it. Give it a try. Audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And now back to our conversation. So the, the, the original, and maybe we, I think we've also maybe, the original thought was that there were going to be two teams in Cleveland battling it out. Yeah, and Arts Ward, uh, you know, at least from what it sounds, I don't know how much he sincerely believed this, but he apparently had the idea that he was going to be able to, con- he and the owners were going to be able to convince the NFL that it could be more of a setup like what existed between the American League and the National League in baseball that once the NFL saw that this was a serious venture, that they would be sort of welcomed as unfriendly competitors, but all under one um, one monopolistic umbrella and operate without rating, without competing for contracts, which of course would drive salaries up. And as you mentioned, the NFL at this point was only at 25 years old and there had been a lot of financial setbacks. Many, many franchises had fallen by the boards. People were basically not really well healed. I mean, a guy like George Hallis had been an NFL player himself and ended up being in part of the ownership group over time. Other people were sort of off in side kind of businesses like the Rooney family and uh, Mara the one guy who was probably the wealthiest by far, and he was quite wealthy, was the guy who owned the Rams. His name was Dan Reeves, not to be confused with the guy who later played for the Cowboys and was a coach for many years. But he owned some kind of supermarket uh, monopoly and had uh, was a bona fide millionaire at a time when that was really a lot of money. But, um, yeah, so the original plan, and everybody knew it from the outset, I don't really know how this would square with the whole idea of getting along peacefully, but the plan, yes, was that they were placing a franchise in Cleveland with the expectations that they were going to be going head to head with the Rams. And then, um, apparently because, you know, uh, he saw greener pastures and was willing to take the chance. Dan Reeves almost immediately after the 1945 season decided to move the franchise to Los Angeles. Um, which didn't get him away from the All-America Conference because uh, the All-America Conference had already established a team that they were going to have playing in Los Angeles too. But um, I think, you know, part of it was that Reeves saw that there was the potential for more money to be made there. But frankly, I think he also, once Paul Brown became kind of the guy who was running the Browns franchise, uh, that was a daunting challenge that maybe I think Reeves was not up to having his team face because Brown's roots were in Ohio. He had been a highly successful high school football coach for 12 years or so, were winning multiple state championships, um, coached only for three years at Ohio state, but won a national championship in his second season. And obviously had all kinds of connections with high school coaches, knew uh, everything that there probably was to know about high school players and college players and not just the state of Ohio, but throughout the region. Um, And just to sidetrack for one second, when I interviewed Eric Parsegian, he told me a story that I found hard to believe, and then I re-checked it down and found out that he was 100% right about it. He grew up in Akron, 
I think he was born 1923, so he would have been starting, you know, in high school sometime in the late 30s. And he knew very well, even as a young boy, of the reputation of Maslin High School, the team that Paul Brown was still coaching at that time. And he told me he went to a scrimmage that was held between the Maslin High School varsity and the Miami of Ohio varsity football team. And Maslin annihilated Miami of Ohio's team. And now you think about that for a minute. I mean, this is literally men against boys, right? You're talking about high school, 16, 17, maybe a couple of 18-year-olds playing on a football team against players who are four years older than they are and who are good enough to be playing college football. Forget about whether Miami is a powerhouse team or not. And Persegian told me that he was there in the stands that day and he saw how they took apart Miami of Ohio's varsity football team. And I think he's speaking to just both what Paul Brown was able to accomplish at all the different levels that he coached at, but also just uh, the kind of talent that was coming out of some of these schools um, in that area. So so that that's some of the picture of, of the beginnings. Well, yeah, that, I mean, what, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. That that's really interesting. I mean, first of all, I guess before, so I guess the 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 Rams uh, sort of made that decision to go to L.A. Um, you know, uh, the, the idea of having two teams in Cleveland, you wonder how big or significant that market is. I mean, obviously, in New York, having multiple teams or Chicago having competitive teams, uh, that's understandable. Cleveland, you know, arguably, why not maybe set up shop, say, in Cincinnati, and you can kind of maybe, you know still de- go deep into that whole, uh, you know, Ohio cradle of football uh, goodness there, right? But uh, but it almost seems that uh, it almost was the gift that was sort of laid upon or on the uh, laps of the Browns uh, that the um, that the Rams did move and basically kind of seeded the, this very uh, rich football market uh, to this brand new team and league. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's very striking that that's the way that happened. I also should say that um, your characterization of the Rams is not entirely accurate. They were a relatively new franchise. I think they came into the NFL in 1937. So they were actually only in Cleveland for nine seasons. And until 1945, they really were bottom feeders. And they struggled financially, and they struggled at the gate. One thing that's not commonly known is I think they didn't play a single game in municipal stadium. I could be wrong about that, but they, uh, until the very final season when they played uh, a kind of famous championship game uh, in December of 1945, but the overwhelming majority of their home games were played at league park and they were, you know, uh, uh, certainly prior to 45, not well attended, In fact, I think the Rams were one of the teams that kind of did a combination thing for one season during the war in order to cut back on expenses. Um, Then in 1945, they kind of surprised everybody. The big difference was that they, that was the first season that Bob Waterfield was their quarterback, et cetera, et cetera. And they were able to go on and win the uh, NFL championship. But yeah, it was, it really did. I mean, the, what would have happened had they stayed? Who knows? But certainly, yes, it was a big boost to the Browns that all of a sudden now they had not, you know, it's Cleveland, but basically the region to themselves, the closest team being Pittsburgh. But, you know, there was no team in Cincinnati at that time. There was no team in Indianapolis at that time. And like I said, I mean, I can't really emphasize enough just the presence of Paul Brown as kind of an Ohio icon, even at that point. Uh, was really a big deal. I was going to say, let's talk about Brown because let's talk about Brown and, and how he puts this sort of this this team together, right? Because obviously, you know, uh, without him, well, obviously he's iconic, right? And and Hall of Fame uh, on on many different levels, right? But um, I mean, wh- wh- how does he go about putting together this team, and 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 how does he create such a an arg- arguably powerhouse so quickly and immediately? Well, some of it had to do with the fact that a lot of these players, as I mentioned, were available. They were not under contract, even though some of them, by the time you get to 1946, are well past, you know, the normal age that you would be graduating from college. A guy like Max Speedy, for example, 
a tremendous uh, athlete at the University of Utah, goes immediately into the military in 1942, plays a little bit of service football, I think. But anyway, he's in the service for four full years until 1946. Paul Brown coaches, uh, I should add that Brown, after his third season at Ohio State, became a commissioned officer and became the coach of a Navy team at a Naval Center uh, in Illinois. So he now not only, so he's building even big more now on who he's seeing play, his evaluation, because now he's playing against military teams from around the country Otherwise, he would probably have had no idea who a guy like Max Speedy was coming all the way from Utah. Another guy, Marion Motley, a well-known high school player in Ohio, but also African-American at a time when the NFL had a color line against black players. He was 26 years old in 1946. He had been a collegiate player, and then he had not been eligible to go into the military because of knee problems, but he worked in a steel mill, stuck around Ohio, and Paul Brown remembered him from when he was in high school in Ohio. So he's putting, and then others, he, you know, a guy like Otto Graham went to Northwestern. So he was playing in the Big Ten uh, at the same time that Brown was coaching Ohio State. He was considered to be an excellent player. He, you know, was drafted in the first round by the Lions. Uh, had things gone otherwise, he would have become probably the quarterback of the Lions. Paul Brown saw enough of him to think that he could build a franchise around him and actually offered him a contract in which Graham would get a monthly check while he was in the service before he did anything for the Browns along with a bonus in order to make sure that he got him under contract. And as it turned out, I guess it was a whole nother year um, that Graham was in the military before the war ended. So he was basically on the Cleveland payroll for a whole year before he ever actually even set foot on a football field. Um, Lots of other guys from the big 10, Lou Saban went to Indiana, um, other guys from Ohio State who maybe were are, are not now as well known as somebody like Lou Groza. Um, one guy, Lynn Houston, had played at Massillon for Brown, had played at Ohio State for Brown, was a C, was had graduated by 1946. He ended up playing eight years as an offensive guard. You know, kind of an unsung, not really well known guy, but a solid player who is one of the pieces that you need if you're building a championship team. And there were a couple of instances, a guy named Lou Rimkus, who was an offensive tackle who had graduated from Notre Dame and played one year with the Washington Redskins in 1943, I think it was, before he went into the military. Well, he was a smart enough guy that he got wind of the fact that this new league was being formed and that it might drive salaries up. So he ended up somehow getting in contact with the Browns or whatever, and he jumped. Um, he jumped from the NFL to the all America conference and became another mainstay guy was an all pro tackle with the Redskins and continued a couple times as an all pro with the Browns. There was also a core of guys. I think it was five, not really big names, but guys again, who are the kind of solid, uh, grunt players that you need who had played for the Rams for varying amounts of time who didn't like the idea of uprooting from Cleveland to move to Los Angeles, not knowing what would happen. Would the team be able to make a go of it? Would they possibly in the next couple of years be looking at a franchise that might go under because it didn't work out or whatever? They decided they wanted to stay in Cleveland and they filed, I guess it was like a collective legal action that they had signed a contract with the Cleveland Rams and that they were not obligated to play for the Los Angeles Rams. I th- um, and so those five players all ended up being part of the Browns because Paul Brown, you know, being the businessman that he was, made them an offer. We have a new football team right here. You don't have to move anywhere. Uh, sign with us. And they did. So he was really drawing from his collegiate uh, background, history, knowledge of who was around in the Big Ten 
players that he coached in uh, Great Lakes Naval Center, opposing players, high school players. I mean, that's how the great story of Mary Motley comes into being. Also, you know, because this was a guy who had things remained as they were, would never have been offered a chance to play pro football. You know, Paul Brown thought this color line stuff was a lot of junk. So he said, why can't I have a black player? And as it turned out, he got two really good ones right from the very beginning. Bill Willis being the other, another guy who had played at Ohio State, grew up in Ohio. Paul Brown knew very well that he was one of the best players probably in the country. You know, if you're trying to win football games, all of a sudden all this stuff like uh, racial uh, restrictions doesn't really make all that much sense, especially if you're a kind of up-and-coming team in an up-and-coming league that kind of really has to establish itself um, fast. And I think Paul Brown, I mean, clearly he had a conscience enough to say, look, I don't care what anybody says. This is what I'm going to do, and if you don't like it, then I'll go back to Ohio State and coach there. So McBride and the others in the All-American Conference, you know, kind of knowing that this was the the key guy in this whole venture conceded and also just knowing that um these two players and as it became more as time went on were going to help his team win a lot of football games and any of the white players in camp who didn't like it they could go find something else to do that was his attitude I also want to call out to our audience that uh, Andy's also uh, wrote a book uh, uh, specifically more around the story of of how uh, pro football uh, became uh, integrated around this time. It's called Gridiron Gauntlet. Um, uh, We'll make sure we have a link to that book uh, uh, up there as well. But let me me ask you also this, though, Andy. How much of it, though, so so Brown's uh, 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 clearly, you know, uh, knowledge about the game and and the players and and the timing of the of the of the war and more players being available now. How much of it, though, was, and this is sort of a segue, I think, too, to an important segue or important tangent, uh, was money, right? Because this league, right, with the Don Amici's of the world and and these other sort of uh, very well-moneyed uh, owners who really wanted to make a splash and quickly, um, you know, I, you could argue there's plenty of talent in Ohio and, and, and Brown's got a good pipeline to it, but arguably the NFL – you'd think would have more a kind of an inside track to this, given that they've got a 25 or so year uh, history. I, I guess my real question is how much of this also was aided and abetted by, I don't know, I don't want to say it's an unending checkbook, but uh, that of owner Mickey McBride and uh, his willingness perhaps to, uh, to spend a bit to kind of make his mark uh, from the earliest uh, of moments with this new franchise. Yeah, that's, that's a essential piece of the story. Um, I think once Brown delivered the goods in terms of being highly successful at the gate and on the field, and as far as I know, being one of the handful, at least in the first couple years of the all America conference, one of the few profitable teams in either league, then it, you know, McBride, it became easier for him to go along with spending the money, outbidding the NFL for players with higher salaries, investing, you know, uh, in amenities that were kind of above and beyond what was normal in pro football at that time for the players. Yeah, I mean, so I think what McBride adds to the picture was, yes, a willingness to perhaps sustain some losses early on in the hopes that Brown is really going to produce. And then whether it's fortunate or not, whether it's just a result of all the hard work and knowledge that the collective group of them had, it does become a successful venture. And, you know, uh, McBride now is both vindicated, but satisfied that this is going to be a kind of stable investment and, you know, as would any business that then leads you to decide that you're willing to invest more or go along with a higher salary for a better player or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, certainly there was risk. I don't have at my fingertips how wealthy McBride was at night at the point when the league started. Um, 
he, he there was risk and a, a lot of the owners did end up losing a lot of money uh some of them were kind of the one owner of the chicago franchise named lindheimer ended up subsidizing some of the owners in order to keep them afloat uh, they had a franchise in Miami that lasted one season that was a complete disaster and went under. So, and also, as I said, it's also important to note that the NFL, and not just because of the competition, but certainly that was a factor, in the NFL were struggling. I mean, the NFL, even as late as this period, is a pretty rocky business venture. I mean, Team, you know, a team like the Steelers, for example, was notorious for just lousy facilities, low salaries, other things along that line. I mean, a lot of it had to do the fact that some of these teams didn't draw well. But it was um, – so I think, yeah, so I think McBride, uh, no question, adds an important piece to the puzzle and – in a different circumstance with a different owner, perhaps the result would have been different. Um, but again, I think a guy like Paul Brown was smart enough to make it clear to McBride what was involved and what he was demanding, both in terms of his own salary, but in terms of, well, this is what it's going to take, both financially and in terms of time and in terms of your commitment to making this a real thing and got enough of it in terms of a written commitment or whatever that he signed on. And if that had not been the case, if McBride had been hesitant or, you know, indicating that he was going to be trying to cut corners in different places, then I'm sure Brown, knowing what I know about him, would not have gone along and just continued to be the coach of the Ohio State, which was a prestigious thing. I mean, it was a lot of controversy that continued – for a couple years thereafter, um, the controversy not, I mean, cause clearly, as you mentioned, college football was the thing much more so than pro football. So for a coach to leave a team that just a few years had been a national champion and which was one of the most prestigious college programs in the country to go off to this new league of a team that had never even played a single game was a big deal. Now, the other controversy that continued was that Brown offered contracts to a couple more players um, in the years after 46 to Ohio State guys who had not finished their eligibility. So there was a little bit of a ruckus, you know, alumni, the, the coach who succeeded him, and just the general Ohio State community was not too happy about all that. But um, anyway, you know, I think McBride did – make a big contribution and maybe the biggest contribution he made was just to be the money guy and to be smart enough to recognize that Paul Brown knew what he was doing and just to stay the hell out of his way. Yeah, that's the interesting thing that how much he, uh, almost implicitly he kind of trusted him. I There was one interesting little tidbit that I sort of uh, discovered in my little research as I got ready for this conversation, uh, which was completely new to me, which is this idea and maybe an example of how uh, uh, McBride indeed did sort of a background, but maybe not in, a, in an obvious way, was this uh, idea of helping Brown keep uh, who he felt were promising players for whatever reasons, but could not offer them immediately a roster spot. Uh, and he, uh, he McBride, uh, through his uh, taxi uh, license ownership uh, uh, part of his, uh, his enterprises there, uh, basically kept him on the, on the taxi payroll, the taxi cab payroll, and uh, hence the term that we still use today, the the, the taxi squad. Um, yeah, that's right. Pretty interesting stuff. Presumably they were not driving cabs, but we, we don't really know. <laughs> they may have been employed in an office somewhere. I'm not really sure. Well, look, they, yeah. also, they also might have been doing publicity, I guess, a bit too, I wonder, because I, what I really want to sort of get into at this point is is the, the team, not only on the field, was uh, quite uh, quite something cur- courtesy of uh, of – a Brown's uh, uh, intelligence and, and approach, but they were a hit on on uh, in the stands uh, immediately upon uh, upon uh, coming to this coming to town, and I think it's very interesting considering that the uh, the Rams had had such a sort of a rocky and uh, a, 
a tenuous sort of history aside from that last championship as they then absconded to to Los Angeles. But, um, you know, beyond sort of dominating on the field for those four years at the AFC, Cleveland also was quite the sensation in the stands too, right? Yes, that's right. Now, they did have the advantage of playing in the uh, Municipal Stadium, which aside from the L.A. Coliseum, I guess was the biggest uh, venue used by pro football at that point. But yeah, right from the very first game in September of 46 against the uh, team that I mentioned previously from Miami, they were drawing massive crowds. Uh, The first year, and then I think the peak was 1947, and it, it is specific to the Browns because they were ahead of pretty much everybody else. But there was a brief couple years where after the war, there was a big increase in attendance at pro sports as a whole. Uh, also in Cleveland, you know, the Indians set the all time at that point attendance record in 1948. Uh, the Browns were especially popular in, when they were playing in New York against a franchise called the New York Yankees, which was a highly competitive franchise in the all America conference, unfortunately didn't last really after the merger, but yeah. So, and the 49ers, which were also one of the best teams and which was also establishing sort of a new thing in San Francisco. First of all, there never having been a pro football team anywhere west of uh, uh, St. Louis, I guess it was. But also, you know, going into what was largely looked at as Cal Stanford territory, even though none of those, neither of those schools is actually in the city of San Francisco and establishing a pro team that became a hit. And when the Browns came to town, Kizar Stadium was generally uh phil so yeah the the browns really made their mark both uh, as a popular team in cleveland but also a team that drew lots of crowd in uh, places like new york san francisco and other places buffalo also when they went on the road now that didn't really last and part of the reason that they didn't last is some of those teams just were not that good so the popularity in a place like Chicago of the franchise there didn't last. As I mentioned earlier, the franchise in Miami went under after one season, but it wasn't just that those teams weren't necessarily all that good, but it was also just that the Browns were so dominant that people, yeah, some portion of them would come out to see this great football team. But in terms of, I mean, what was missing often was competitive football. Um, I mean, the Browns lost a total of four games in four years. So that gives you a little bit of a picture. And not all the games were completely one-sided. But the expectation, I think, of fans going to a game to see this big team coming from out of town maybe get their comeuppance by the home squad uh, was kind of missing after a while because it wasn't happening. So that that's a, to me, that feels to me like a fundamental question. So So – Explain to me a little bit about um, as we sort of kind of uh, round uh, round third base here, I guess, on this. Where you know, just how good do you think they were relative to how, say, not so good the rest of the AAFC teams were? I mean, what well, where is the debate sort of lie on that? Because it seems like it's a little of both, but maybe perhaps tilted more towards. And as we get into their absorption into the NFL, maybe it kind of sort of settles the debate that might have been more controversial prior to that then about how just how good this Browns team was in the AAFC? Well, to me, it doesn't really make sense to get bogged down in discussion of which league was better. Um, I think, I think uh, I don't really see too much of a case that the all America conference was better than the NFL. I probably uttered those words myself somewhere along the way, but you know, I, I can see that maybe the NFL would have a slight edge. I think the bigger thing is how good were the Browns compared to the best teams in the NFL those four years? Because it's one thing to say, well, yeah, you know, they won championships against inferior teams, which I don't think is actually 100% true. But I think the bigger question is, 
were the Browns better than the teams that won the NFL championship during those four years? And I think there's a very solid case that the answer is yes. Uh, and I actually kind of go into that a little bit year uh, one by one in the book. And the biggest thing that I fall back on is that the all America conference was tremendously respected in a lot of areas. For example, newspapers and uh, wire services and magazines that picked combined all pro teams. The all America conference was well represented on all those teams every year for the whole four years. Relative, I mean, it was a smaller league. It had fewer teams, so you wouldn't expect. And there was probably, I'm sure, a little bit of a bias uh, in favor of the NFL because of its longer history. But it's not much below 50% at any point. So people who, in, say, Chicago, were seeing lots of games of both leagues or New York where there was uh, three teams actually at that point, two teams in the All-America Conference plus the Giants. So sports writers in those cities plus Los Angeles, where there was one team from each league, had a chance to see pretty much every player from both leagues. And this is the conclusion that a lot of them were coming to, that the players in this upstart league were good enough in large numbers to be included on these combined all-pro teams. The biggest thing, again, goes back to what we started off with, which was what the Browns did in 1950 and thereafter for the uh, up and through the end of 1955. Dominating. I mean, not just good, not just competitive, but posting a winning percentage that no team in the last 75 years has matched for six years. Nobody. Not the Packers with all their championships. Not the Steelers. Not anybody. 75 years worth of football, the six-year period of 1950 to 55, the Browns have the highest winning percentage of any team. Um, And as I said earlier, coming into an already existing league and winning a championship, something something that nobody else has ever done. And I would say although they were obviously continuing to add players through the draft and that they did have uh, a dispersal draft in 1950 when the NFL kind of divided up the players from the All-America Conference from the teams that didn't come into the NFL, but all the teams had equal access to drafting all those players. You know, that's a key story. Well, people say, well, okay, the Browns added Len Ford in 1950, a Hall of Fame defensive end, great player, obviously made them better over the long run. That's true, but it's also true that every single NFL team passed on Ford because the Browns were stuck at the ends of the line when it came to drafting these players, and all the other 12 teams passed. And Paul Brown, having seen Len Ford play, both at Michigan and for the Los Angeles Dons, selected him, and he became a Hall of Famer. I don't know. What are you supposed to say about that? That's not anybody's fault, except the Browns took advantage of a situation where they apparently knew more than anybody else. And the last thing I'll say, I know that we're, uh, as you said, rounding third base. There were two things that I wanted to point out that have to do with the whole argument about how, well, you know, now you look at the playoffs and you see these teams and they have to win a minimum of three games in the postseason and sometimes four if they're a wild card team to, to win the Super Bowl. Okay, that's true. What's missing from that picture is that in the 12 or 13 league NFL of the 1950s, you either finished first in your conference or you were done. So you had no second chance to make the postseason. Either you maintained long-term regular season excellence enough so that nobody finished ahead of you, or you went out to play golf in December when the season ended. So you have all kinds of teams. The Chicago Bears in 1948 finished 10-2, and two, done, because somebody finished with a better record than they did. The 49ers in 1953 finished 9-3, and three, done, because the Lions had a better record than they did. The great Lombardi era, 
1963, the Packers, 11-2 and 1, finished second by a half a game to the Bears. Done. No second chance, no wild card, no let's broaden the field and bring in these very good teams that maybe are deserving, but they weren't good enough to finish first. The Browns had to finish first place in their conference every year just to make it to the championship game, and they didn't miss until 1956. So I think, you know, when you look at the modern era, whether you're talking about the Patriots, whether you're talking about the Steelers of the 70s, whether the Joe Montana era of the 49ers, now obviously the league has gotten much bigger, so there are more teams, but every single one of those teams finished not with the best record in their conference at least once when they won the Super Bowl. So... Obviously, you have a bigger league with more teams. You need to add more slots either by making the division smaller or whatever. I get all that. I'm not arguing against that. I'm simply pointing out that especially when you have a 12-game season, if your quarterback is hurt in the middle of the season and misses three games and maybe you lose two of those games in a 12-game season where you have to finish first, the likelihood is that you're done. And that actually happened. Paul, you know, Otto Graham missed a couple of games somewhere along the way due to injury or parts of games. Other key players injured, whatever, or just the natural, you know, thing that every great team loses at least once or twice during a regular season. You know, you just don't have a situation like you had the year when the Giants finished nine and seven, were like sixth in seeded in the NFC. And then, oh, gee, we got hot in January and we won the Super Bowl. That's a completely different animal. Never would have happened anything like that in 1950s. The other thing I'll mention, and I'm sorry I'm going on so long. No, about this, this is this is absolutely terrific. I, and I've got one more okay. question after you're done with that. Go ahead. It makes complete sense, right, looking at it from 2019, that you seed the playoff teams based on what the best record is. So the team with the best record is the highest seed and gets to play all the games at home as long as they survive on down to the number six seed who never gets to play at home and has to go on the road to win all their games. It makes so much sense. Is like, how could you have ever done it otherwise? Well, it was done otherwise. And the Browns had to play multiple championship games on the road against teams that had inferior records to them. It happened in 1951, which is maybe the most dramatic example because the Rams were 8-4, and four, the Browns were 11-1, and one, and the game was played in Los Angeles. It happened again in 1953, 1955, and if we carry it over into 1957, it happened then too, even though that's sort of outside the parameters of upward discussion. And keep in mind, too, that whole thing about what I said about 1951 – Think about the difference between playing a game at Christmas time in Cleveland compared to Los Angeles and what the advantage would be if the team that finished 11 and 1 got to play at home based on the weather, all that kind of stuff. So and it so happens that in all these dynasties that we've talked about uh, up until the mid 70s when the seeding process began, take for example the Steelers 1974, the first time they won the Super Bowl, they were the third best record in the AFC. Somehow, they were the one who was, because it was simply done on a rotation basis at that time, they were seeded as the top seed, even though both the Dolphins and the Raiders had better records than they did, and they won their divisions as the Steelers had. Who gets to play the wild card team, which happened to be a very weak team that year, the Bills? The Steelers, at home, of course. Meanwhile, the two best teams in the AFC play an epic playoff game in Oakland, the Sea of Hands game, won by the Raiders. And then the the Steelers were able to go into Oakland and beat the Raiders for the AFC championship and go on to win the Super Bowl a couple weeks later, whatever it was. The point simply is that For all the arguments that can be made about how it's, yeah, it's more difficult now because you have to win at least three games in the postseason. You have to win four if you didn't finish in one of the top two seeds. 
and it has happened. Um, you know, people don't want to hear that there were other things that kind of worked against the Browns. Um, and keep in mind that in 1951, the example that I mentioned, they ended up losing the game in Los Angeles against the Rams. 1953, they had a better record than the Lions did in the regular season. They had to go to Detroit and play the championship game in Detroit, and they lost on a last-minute touchdown. So do I say automatically the result would have been reversed if those games had been played in Cleveland? No. But common sense dictates you that every single fan or player or coach who's ever had anything to do with football would rather play in their home stadium than on the road in a game of that magnitude. So I think these are a couple of things that get lost when I hear all this stuff about you know, the Patriots, all of which, you know, a great, great run, tremendous run, almost. Um, I mean, there are things that we could delve into about that that are just unbelievable off the charts in this era. But there's also things that both worked, uh, I don't want to say against the Browns, but worked. They were things that had to be overcome that were just understood. You know, if you didn't finish first, you didn't mope and complain to the commissioner about it, about how unfair this is. Look, we finished 10 and two and we didn't make it to the playoffs. It was understood. Either you were the best team in your conference or you went home, you know, um, and the Browns were able to do that. Whether you want to extend it to the whole 10 year period of their dynasty, every single season, or even if we just shrink it down to the six years of the NFL, they were able to beat out all the competition in their division or conference for six straight years, um, knowing that if they didn't do so, they would be done. Well, and I think that's that's sort of a, a really a good place to sort of put a nice exclamation point around it. Because, look, the, the transition to the NFL, right, I think, you know, for, for many of the naysayers of the old AAFC and, and – you know, as Cleveland sort of came into that, right, as sort of the, all right, well, now let's see you do it, right? I mean, which, by by the way, seemed to be sort of the, uh, it continues to sort of uh, uh, be the case with all these challenger leagues, even afterwards, like the AFL, right? Those those early uh, Super Bowl uh, games between the, 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 the winners of both of those leagues, right? I mean, until the Jets, literally almost, I think this week, 50 years ago, right, you know, kind of sort of slayed that dragon with the, you know, inferiority complex of the uh, of the AFL once and for all. I mean, the Browns wasted no time, uh, uh, you know, uh, squashing uh, any semblance of, of confusion as to whether uh, they were going to be uh, of quality caliber uh, competition for anybody in the NFL. Uh, well, let me just interrupt, too, because yeah, we didn't ahead. even mention the fact that in their very first NFL game, they were scheduled against the Eagles a special arrangement a Saturday night rather than normal Sunday afternoon. Now, the Eagles had won the two previous NFL championships and were widely hailed as one of the greatest teams in NFL history. And so the Browns came into Philadelphia, not in Cleveland. Of course, Burt Bell, the commissioner, made sure the game was played in the Eagles' home uh, stadium. Yeah, this is uh, September 16th, 1950, for all you uh, aficionados out there. Go ahead. 35 to 10. Final score, you know, the Browns uh, basically took apart this team that right up until the moment that they played them was being hailed as one of the greatest of all time. And it still can be considered that. I mean, you know, the fact that they were maybe weren't as good as the Browns in 1950, and I would argue in 1949 or 1948 either, doesn't mean that they weren't a great team. But, you know, as one of the guys said after the game from the Eagles, well, we just played a team from the big leagues, and they took us apart. And and look, I think that's so. So not only did that sort of, uh, you know, was that sort of a shot across the bow. I mean, that uh, it, it, the winning the the championship their first year, and then and the so it, it's clearly all right. So let me ask you this one one question. I you've convinced me, I, and not that I needed convincing, right? But I think this is a very important thing, and I think any sort of old uh, school Cleveland Browns fan. And I'm talking about sort of the 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 natural uh, history of that franchise that I guess arguably or officially sort of resides in Baltimore now, but you know for whatever whatever. Um, let me sort of let me ask you this point of question. I've asked this of a, of a few of our guests when we've uh, branched into the AAFC. At what point, if ever, right? And you're part of the professional uh, researchers group with the with, with from Pro Football. When do, when and if do you think? 
the AAFC gets its due or official recognition uh, with the NFL, especially in light of the Browns' overall legacy? Or or is that just ship sailed and, and never sort of gets gets reconciled? Because it feels to me that until and when and unless you get sort of some closure on the contributions of the AAFC generally, despite the relative lopsidedness of the Browns' performance there, I, I think you can't laud people like Paul Brown and all and Otto Grant and all the folks involved with the Cleveland Browns franchise of original uh, without sort of clarifying and or uh, making whole, I guess, this the the reality that they were part of a of a of a challenger league that in 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 many cases could have been argued that was part of their dynasty before they got into the NFL and was frankly a part of that overall story right so i guess the question is that there is one in there does the a AAF- the ship has sailed the ship has sailed okay so okay yeah. but it's 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 for a sm- a very very tiny group of people who do football research to sort of keep alive, maybe just for the benefit of their own circle and a small number of people just outside of that circle. I think, I think, I mean, I remember thinking when Paul Brown died, I think absolutely then it was too late. Um, I don't know how much power he had. You know, he was one owner of, dozens. Um, and I think that he continued to try to push that point somewhat. I don't know how late, but certainly by the time he died, which I guess was 1990, um, there was no way anything was going to change. I think I corresponded with the late Paul Zimmerman, um, a number of times. He was a big, advocate of the AAFC. He actually, I think, went so far as to say that the AAFC was better than the NFL. (laughs) Um, He grew up in New York. He was like a high school, college age guy in the late 40s. So he would go to games and he eventually became, you know, one of the most influential sports writers. I think while there were people like him and John Stedman in Baltimore and whoever in Cleveland and writers and ex players you could throw into now. I mean, there's just so few people with any kind of firsthand observation and those who are alive probably gave up on it so long ago because, you know, I mean, the NFL just was not going to budge. They um, felt like they had won the war which basically they did. And okay. Yeah. We're happy to have this great team come in and contribute to our league and the other teams that came in contribute to our league and leave it at that. Um, as far as the legacy, I don't think the powers that be in the NFL wanted anything to do with, uh, Either rec- even just recognizing that the AAFC was a major league, the way it recognizes clearly that the all, uh, American Football League of the 1960s was. I mean, I don't think even the most diehard AFL partisan would say that the AFL of the early 60s was anywhere near as good as the NFL. But because the AFL hung on and was able to force like a real merger, I mean, what happened in 1950 was more of like what you said, an absorption um, with specific terms where all of every single thing that happened in the AFL is now considered to be NFL history. Everything that George Blander, for example, did in the 1960s is part of his NFL history book, whatever. There's no asterisk for those nine, 10 years that he played saying this was not accomplished in the NFL. It's just completely accepted that everything that happened during those 10 years in the AFL is part of the NFL now. And yet, and yet, um, the di- and yet the dynastic uh, uh, exploits of the, of the Cleveland Browns, especially in the first years of the NFL could not be rewound from the, the years prior to that uh, as part of their overall history. Huh? I think, 
that that could have been on the agenda maybe for 10, 15 or 20 years after the after 1950, but as time has gone on, no. I mean, I just don't see who, who I, I the powers that be at this point in the NFL would have absolutely no interest in doing that and would be going out of their way to probably denigrate a rival league from that far back that nobody knows about that only a couple of teams came out of. Um, I don't know. Like I, mean, I said, I, yeah, maybe it's naive on my part, right? But, uh, you know, when last I checked, it is the pro football hall of fame, not the NFL hall of fame. Right. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of overhang and, and look, I mentioned it very early in our conversation, right? There, this, this, this is not just endemic to that of the NFL and pro football, but, but many major league sports and, and, and they're, embrace or um selective uh forgetfulness i guess on uh on on various parts of history again it just seems to me that with such an iconic franchise with so chock full of um uh, memorable and hall of fame players and, and administrators and coaches uh and yeah. a team that is just such a, a giant legacy as part of this fabric of the nfl uh, to not think that i don't know it it, it, it kind of belies logic to me to not at least admit or understand that uh, they had a bit of a history and significant before officially becoming part of the NFL. Well, the other thing too is probably uh, unfortunate circumstances in a lot of ways was Paul Brown's termination from the Browns um, makes a big juncture there. I mean, if he had continued to be associated in some way with the Browns after 1963, forget about even right up until he died but say for another 10, 15, 20 years, maybe he would have been someone who would have kept fighting more along that line. Once he got fired, I think maybe he had uh, a, a little bit less uh, motivation to do that. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the Hall of Fame because technically the Hall of Fame is a little bit of a separate entity from the NFL. But clearly, they sort of are on board with what we're talking about here. Because you take a guy like Marion Motley, right? I mentioned that he started his pro career when he was somewhat of an advanced age, 26, which is old for a running back. So basically, he has about six good seasons, four in the All-America Conference, and then he wins the rushing title in 1950 and then has an, you know a little bit more success after that. By which point he's in his 30s and he's declining and he's got bad knees already before he even started playing pro football. He was one, you know, he, I, I don't think it was his, the first, it was like the fifth class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And he was elected along with all kinds of other guys who were widely considered to be slam dunks. So I think people who are sort of evaluating the individual player greatness of some of these guys recognized that, yeah, both in terms of the fact that these players and this team were able to continue to be great after, starting in 1950 and afterwards is an argument in favor of what they had done before. Same thing with people like Dante Lavelli. You know, he plays a little bit longer than Motley, but it's the same thing. He put up great numbers in both leagues, and it was accepted that, yeah, well, you know, how can you say that he was not as good before 1950 as he was after? Otto Graham, a little bit of the same, although he was just so off the charts in the 50s that I think there was no way that anybody could have said, no, he doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. Um, and, we, you know, we could look at other players, too, along that line. But I think the point simply is that when you get a little bit of separation from the official NFL point of view, oh, another example would be the all-decade teams that were selected in the 1940s and 1950s. You see a whole host of players from the All-America Conference being picked. Um, I don't remember exactly who the official body was that was picking these teams, but like I said, the perception at the time was much different than it became even just 20 years later. And certainly as we uh, today or even, you know, 30, 40 years after the fact, um, because you had a lot more people who had firsthand experience seeing the uh, games and the players. And also you had players who were kind of keeping the memory alive a little bit, too, um, even just 
I mean, not visibly in terms of any kind of campaigning, but, it, you know, how could you interview somebody who played against Marion Motley and say that he, you know, this is a guy who, when he walked on the field, considering all of his skills, was maybe the best guy on the field out of 66 or 80 players or whatever it was. As soon as he walked on and put a uniform on whichever team he was playing for, that team had a distinct advantage. Um, you know, how could you argue that he piled up these numbers against inadequate uh, competition when he did the same thing thereafter in 1950? So, anyway... Yeah, th- I mean, this is this is. I, I, look, I I I appreciate this is this is a, a really uh, a, a good and solid conversation about a team that, um, you know, I, I I is I think undeniably part of the of the fabric of the NFL, and you know, it's also part of of some of the challenges, right? And we we've talked extensively on this show about lots of different sort of challenger leagues. I think football uniquely. Uh, has been and now with two more leagues uh, coming up, right? Uh, one in February with the uh, uh, Alliance of American Football and then the re- reboot of the X- XFL next year, right? I mean, see, there's an interesting it's an interesting sport this professional football, despite all of its problems and issues and maybe even medical challenges and you know that are sort of coming to light. There's that doesn't seem to be any shortage of, of people that want to sort of step up and take a crack at at the NFL and either change it or evolve it or perhaps even uh, uh, alternatively uh, play it. Um, and this is, to me, almost uh, uh, as, as part of the fabric of pro football, this specific story about the Browns, uh, as it is sort of a, a bigger conversation about the, the sport and, and how it gets challenged in the, uh, in the years past and years to come. That's well said. Um, I think all that is going to happen without any kind of place for the All-America Conference in the discussion, I'm sorry to say. It used to be a big deal to me. I mean, I think there was a senator in Ohio, Sherrod Brown. Does that does that sound I right? I think that's right, sure. Um, the year that the Patriots went through the season undefeated, 07, I guess it was. And as happens every year, whenever somebody gets to 10-0 and 0 or whatever, um, they begin talking about the 72 Dolphins. Well, this guy wanted recognition that the 1948 Browns had also gone 14 and 0 and won their championship, and that they, the field should be expanded to two teams that went door, uh, start to finish, on the perfect, no ties, no losses, nothing. Uh, as far as I know, it never got anywhere. Certainly, the NFL was not going to include the Browns into any kind of discussion about that with the Dolphins. So. That was the last moment when I saw this kind of thing anywhere visibly, and that's, what, 11 years ago. So it's sort of like a lot of things. Maybe this is a way to sort of, among a small circle of people, keep more attention on it than it would otherwise get. All right, there you have it, and uh, it is a uh, compelling argument uh, that Andy brings up and uh, uh, about the Cleveland Browns' role uh, and position in uh, in football, pro football, uh, NFL uh, history, uh, its place as a team, dynastic as it might be, the players that uh, were part of it, the uh, administrators, the uh, coach, certainly Paul Brown, etc. Uh, it's very difficult to... Um, to ignore uh, the first few years of their existence, the dominance of such in the AAFC uh, and uh, the uh, contribution uh, that that had to uh, what ultimately became a dynastic uh, uh, representation in the early years uh, in their uh, time in the NFL as well. And, um, you know, it is, uh, you know, perhaps this is a little nook or cranny in the uh, sort of forgotten wings of, uh, of pro football sports history, but uh You know, this is partially why we do this show. Uh, We try to call out some of these uh, issues and uh, we try not to forget them. And frankly, we're trying to bring them front and center to uh, some new generations of fans that, uh, for whatever reason, just don't know about these uh, little stories, these little anecdotes, these little uh, 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 parts of of the historical narrative that, you know, uh, I you know, I don't think should be forgotten. Certainly shouldn't be uh, swept away uh, and they need to be sort of grappled with and understood and maybe sort of come to some kind of. uh, some kind of conclusion and uh, you know I, this is hardly a crusade but uh, look the idea of uh, just simply negating uh, the first four years 
uh, of the Cleveland Browns history, which is kind of what you do when you forget or choose not to officially uh, commemorate or remember, uh, or at least uh, put into the record books, uh, the uh, Ameri- All-America Football Conference of the late 19, uh, 1940s, excuse me. Um, I, I think it's just, uh, it, 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 it belies the total uh, uh, story of history of, of pro football in this country uh, when you simply ignore or forget it. Uh, and obviously, as we've uh, talked about in our conversations, uh, not only that, but a bunch of other places uh, where the challenges, shall we say, to the NFL uh, have been real, have been, uh, 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 you know, substantiated uh, and for whatever reasons uh, brushed away as well. So, you know, I, I, let's talk about it. Uh, and uh, one way to show uh, more interest in this topic and this uh, this story uh, is to buy a copy of Andy's book. It's called The Best Show in Football, the 1946 to 1955 Cleveland Browns. Uh, it is published um, by Taylor Trade Press, uh, and you will find a link to it as well as uh, uh, Andy's other books uh, that we mentioned before as well, uh, including the uh, very relevant uh, Gridiron Gauntlet, the story of the men who integrated pro football, also published by Taylor Trade uh, Publishing. You'll find uh, a link to those books as well as Andy's uh, uh, novel that he wrote uh, on our website at uh, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Just search up episode number, my God, episode 97. Can you believe that? Just search up that episode with Andy and you will find uh, convenient links uh, to both uh, or all three of those books uh, from that website. And by all means, uh, do so there because you'll give us a couple of uh, a couple of nickels, a couple of dimes for our uh, value, I guess, in the process and help keep our lights on and the heat going in the uh, cold winter months as we try to continue to give you all these great shows and episodes and stories about what used to be in professional sports. And we appreciate you doing that. I'm sure Andy will, too. And uh, we also appreciate you uh, uh, checking us out, uh, not only on the website, but also our social media feeds. Follow us early and often, if you will. Uh, on Twitter, you'll find us at Good Seats Still. On uh, Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, on Facebook, there's a page devoted to us there. You can send us email either through a link through the website or just send it to, it directly for, uh, to us directly, by all means. That's uh, hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And please, 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 if there's anything you could ever do for this show, uh, if it's not patronizing some of our sponsors, if it's not buying some of the books, uh, if it's not just listening religiously each week, as more and more of you are doing, please, by all means, rate and review this silly little show, will you? Give it some pretty decent ratings too. Uh, explain why you like the show, hopefully. Uh, that's on Apple uh, Podcasts or Apple iTunes or frankly, wherever you can rate and review the show, wherever you listen. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, to no end uh, some rankings of such to uh, help uh, get the algorithm up and uh, up going and recommend it to uh, other people like you who might similarly enjoy this show. Uh, that is probably the best and uh, least expensive thing you can do uh, to help us uh, support the show. And we appreciate that uh, uh, amazingly and to no end. And uh, we thank you for doing so. And we also thank uh, our friend Jerry Payne for doing so. That is putting our collective pieces together this week and every week. And uh, he and his friends at Podfly Productions uh, are responsible for doing that. And if you need some podcasting uh, support uh, as you're c- contemplating or, or looking to take to the next level your own podcast efforts, by all means, check them out. Podfly Productions. You can find them at podfly.net. All right. My thank you. Uh, my thanks. My thank you, of course. Thank you to all. He stumbles his way into saying uh, for listening to our uh, little show. And uh, we appreciate uh, all of your commentary. Uh, We look forward to seeing you again next week. And until then, we wish you nothing but uh, safety and happiness and uh, and uh, Godspeed. Until then, we'll uh, we'll we'll talk to you next week. Bye bye. 